Welcome along to Point Blank Music School here in London, uh, where today we are very pleased to welcome DJ and producer Shadow Child uh, for this instalment in our live masterclass series, which is brought to you in association with DJ Mag. <laughs> So Shadow Child uh, made his, his debut uh, earlier this year on the Mighty Dirty Bird Records um, and kind of really blew up, I think mostly due to the fact that um, the, his track String Thing was kind of dominating the sets of Eats Everything and, and Claude Von Stroke. Um, but it is uh, a new alias for, for one of House Music's kind of um, pretty well-known names really, um, an alias that has, has really kind of led him down a path of, of new uh, underground bass, bass heavy sounds really. Um, so yeah, we're here to, to get a bit more of an insight into um, how um, he works in the studio, um, to, to get a look at um, how he puts his tracks together and, and some of the techniques he uses um, with Logic Pro. Uh, we're also going to be putting your questions forward uh, throughout the session and, and kind of go through some at the end as well. Um, so if you do have anything you want to ask, just, just um, post in the chat room and I will liaise them as we go along. Um, also, just before we get into it, if you do want to learn a bit more about Point Blank, about what we do here, then head over to pointblankonline.net or pointblanklondon.com. Um, and yeah, that, that's enough from me. I think we'll get into it and uh, let's give it up for, for Shadow Child. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I just um, kind of stumbled across this new sound, which actually isn't that new, I suppose. It's a fusion of, for me anyway, house, drum and bass, which is, which is my roots. You know, before I was doing anything, um, I was kind of started DJing, I suppose, when I was about 18, uh, after leaving school and stuff. Before that, I'd learned to do what I do actually at school. I was quite fortunate, my, student, my school, music um, department were quite forward thinking and rather than triangles and recorders and things they uh, bought a sampler and keyboards and an Atari ST uh, with notator which was like, like the, the kind of the best sequencer back then or one of the best so I, I was quite fortunate my intro point to making music was quite early on it was also without letting on about my age too much sort of early 90s uh, which is when electronic music, dance music was first hitting like the UK massively. And although I was only kind of 11, 12 years old, um, I caught the bug pretty early on. That's not a surprise now because I think people at that age are into this and they are getting Reason and Fruity Loops or whatever they make the music on, on their computers and having a go. But really back then it's just a completely different thing. And to have access to that kit, I didn't realise it at the time, but I realise now how fortunate I was because you know, there weren't many schools at that time that had any equipment at all, really. So, so that was my, my entry point. DJing wasn't a thing. I didn't know anything about club culture. I just had heard these DJ mixtapes, rave tapes, from the local record shops that friends, older brothers and sisters were coming home with, and we would listen to those. And then, uh, yeah, got the DJ bug, kind of fell out of love with making music because uh, it was quite an expensive thing to do then. Uh, you had to have lots of hardware and all that kind of stuff. So uh, as soon as Propeller Heads brought Reason out, that brought making music back to me and, you know, on a, like a shoestring budget, basically, on a, on a kind of very average PC, I could actually start making music again. So that was whenever Reason 1 came out, late, late 90s, something like that. So then, you know, my former alias kind of took off and, and, and did really well off of me using Reason. A lot of the early kind of it wasn't even called electro house but it ended up being called electro house uh was was around um and my success kind of came with that which was great but this new project for me is really much more kind of forward thinking you know that sound for me kind of it kind of ran its course for me personally and i kind of felt like i wanted to have a bit more fun with what i was doing again which is why i made string thing i hadn't met eats everything or any of the dirty bird guys or anything but i just i heard eats everything's entrance song 
on the radio and I was like, that track I've done, that's going to fit. That's going to fit somewhere, I can tell. And that track was, was string thing. So that's how the Shadow Child thing kind of started. I didn't know where, where I was going musically with Dave Spoon anymore. So uh, that's, that's how it kind of started off, really. Um, my main tool, if you like, has always been Reason. It still is now. Uh, I use Logic for audio, obviously remix stems, that kind of thing. Um, I use some plugins as well, but something I really have adopted in the last few years is the UAD software. You know, I really, I love it and I can't sort of do without it. So that this is the UAD satellite box here that I've got with me today. Um, my studio is basically the new uh, MacBook, which chains into my uh, Thunderbolt display at home. So this is my whole studio. I've got hardware and stuff back there as well. But, you know, that's why I can pick this up and kind of go anywhere with this box. And how this was able to happen, I, go, I guess, quite easily today. Um, so what I've done today is brought a few tracks with me. Some of them uh, you might be familiar with, uh, some you might not, but they're all things that I've done recently. Uh, the Delphic remix, which has had a little bit of um, a little bit of success recently, which was great. Uh, a few other remixes on there as well, and, and some originals. And I've also got uh, the String Thing track and the Rustic Chip track, which were the first two on on Dirty Bird that kind of you know I was really fortunate to. To get them signed to them. So I'm just say, so you know, the string thing. Were, yeah. you, were you making similar stuff like that before? Was that the kind of the first foray into that? Yeah, I was always messing about with stuff like that. I just love all the bassline stuff, mm. and I love, you know, real house. I think the old kind of electro kind of thing went a kind of a bit too big arena type mm. sound, and I just couldn't, I just couldn't uh, sort of um, couldn't really get into it. Do you know what I mean? I mm. just I, it was hard, you know, and I. You know, they, that sound is huge, obviously, and that's partly where that project, I, I guess, people kind of wanted that to go. But for me, it was kind of just going back to basics and just writing kind of groovy house music, mm. really, with, with big bass lines. And it's not a million miles away from what Spoon was when, it, when I first started that, because the early stuff, like At Night and stuff, was, you know, just a house groove and a simple melodic kind of mm. bass line, really. And it's not a million miles away, but what I find now is that, you know, with this kind of new sound is that you know everyone's attention has kind of swayed away a bit from dubstep and people want to kind of grow up a bit with their with their musical kind of sound that they like and I think that's why this is really working and obviously mm. with people like Disclosure, Eats, the Dirty Bird guys have been doing it for a while you know um, obviously you know and it's the music is all there all ready to go so I think that's why it's kind of kind of a working but just to answer your question yeah I was always making stuff I didn't really have a route for string thing I mm. knew it wasn't a spoon record it would I would have put it out possibly and it might have just done nothing just yeah, sat there and yeah. but because I gave it to, to Dan to eat and he loved it and then Barkley uh, loved it oh, Claude Von Stroke that whole thing and it just it just then started as a bit of a snowball really so yeah it's really fortunate they were into it and they didn't really know that it was me to start with I didn't I never made a big deal that it was me it doesn't really matter you know it's a new fresh project I didn't want any restrictions or any kind of boundaries that you mm. get from sticking a name on something you know so so yeah um I've got a string thing here actually well I don't kind of want to dip into it sort of straight away I was I've loaded up this uh Delphic remix which I did uh recently um there were so many parts for this. There's loads. I think I might have deleted a few. There's some bits on there that I didn't use, and there's loads that I didn't even bring into the project. There were so many layers, and you know, a lot of it really interesting. Some of it, you know, isolated wasn't very interesting. As as a, as a whole working track, the original sounds great, obviously, but you know, the parts, you know, it was all about the vocals really and the strings. There's some live strings in it, which are which are amazing and. Um, I'm a sucker for, for anything that's got live strings in it. So I, I headed straight for that. <laughs> I think it's worth saying with remixes, you know, because if you get a bit of success, people want remixes done, obviously. And I think it's really important to listen, forget the name, forget the label, the fee, and anything like that. And actually just really listen to the, the music and listen to the parts and listen to what you're going to be able to get your hands on. Because I've had it several times before and, and recently where I've said, yes, I'll, I'll give it a go. And I get the stems, and I'm just like, I don't know what to, yeah. don't know what to work with. So make sure that if you, you know, if you if you get into, you know, getting doing paid remixes and things like that, for, who, for whoever, 
just kind of make sure that there's elements in there that you're gonna you're gonna be into that are gonna gonna inspire you. I think. Um, I guess the backbone of my track, I always start with Reason. All the drums and stuff, I love doing in Reason. The re-drum drum machines. This is how I learned to program uh, my beats when I was young. We had a 606 drum machine at my school, amongst some other random kit that probably should, shouldn't yeah. have been in a school. Well, there was a 303 as well, believe it or not. <laughs> a Juno 60 and some other bits that were just in a cupboard. And the music Sweet. teacher got those kind of retrofitted so we could use them. So it was like... It didn't feel weird to me at that time because mm. I was just young. But having yeah, left yeah. school, I'm like, yeah, that's pretty weird. <laughs> so anyway, I used to borrow this 606 drum machine, which is like the old Roland kind of step sequence of drum programming. So as soon as I saw Reason, this is exactly how you do your drum programming on, on there. And that's why I really took to it straight away. I think I saw Rebirth first, actually, which is a 909, 808 and, and stuff. So they, I knew you know, that their stuff was always going to be really interesting for me to work with. So I, I kind of layer my drums up uh, using several drum machines normally. There's only a couple on there, actually. It's quite simple. Uh, there's a couple of loops as well. One thing I will say with drum loops is a lot of people think that it's not very creative to just stick a loop in and just leave it running. So what I, what I generally do is get it in recycle and into uh, a Rex player. Sometimes I use it straight, but I'll dip frequencies or change the pitch, something like that, or I will reprogram it. So, you know, don't be afraid of using sample packs, just use them creatively, I mm -hmm. think. I use all the obvious ones that probably most people get. There's Vengeance and, you know, the Muteki stuff, everything, it's all amazing, but I think as long as you're using it your own way and being actually creative with it, then don't, don't shy away from mm. it, because people have a bit of a stigma with sample packs. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, so I always start with a, with a drum groove. So on this, it was just kind of skippy, skippy drums, just turn up a bit. Just kind of signature at the moment for most people, I guess. Um, so that would have been programmed in here. So you can, that's probably how I would have started it. And then, you know, having dropped it down into reason on the sequencer, I've then edited stuff out and and change things, so that's why it developed from, from that. Let's just take that off. Uh, then there was, um, those drums actually develop a bit more. If I, I'm just gonna go into Logic as well and bring up the mixer and just isolate the drums. Um, my drums come into, on a separate channel in Logic through uh, Rewire. Um, I know I mix any dr any other drums I might add in Logic as well, or go on to like a drum bus um, uh, as well, which is just kind of the way I the way I work. Um, it's good for compression as well. It's sometimes good to have a separate limiter on your drums. That's how I work, and and you know to have separate control of like a drum mix kind of thing. So that's how the drums kind of ended up. Uh, some hi hats and stuff coming in. I won't I isolate anything in a minute. I'll, I'll just let it play. But again, just layering things up. I mean, obviously now with plugins, you've got no limit. The only limit is the speed of your computer. Really, mm. if you've got a plugin or if you've got Reason, you can add as many devices as you like. If you're working with hardware, you've got one drum machine or whatever, and that's it. Becomes a, a limitation without bouncing everything down as audio. So yeah, I, I normally just keep layering things up and, and stuff. So sometimes there's just a couple of drum machines maybe on one of my tracks. Other times there might be 10 doing different little kind of things, you know. Uh, separation's really important though. Um, let me just head back into Logic. <laughs> So I use that kind of old school, the old school kind of, I don't think it is an M1 organ, but it sounds yeah, that it sounds way. Like My controller's not working, I saw that in a minute. Uh, again, just all those old school sounds coming back at the moment, but you can see here on the sampler, it isn't a multi-layer, multi-sample kind of patch, it's literally just a sample, it's actually a DX, a Yamaha DX organ, which, it, well, you can hear what it does. It does the same kind of thing as the as the old M1 sound. Um, I wasn't set on that straight away. I remember with this, I tried another couple of bass lines as well. Obviously, there's a lot of 
signature bass sounds that go on at the moment, like the 808 tom or, or kick drum can be used. Um, a lot of the old kind of drum and bass or old garage kind of sounds are coming back at the moment. There's mm. a guy called um, Friend Within and a lot of his stuff is using a lot of those old, real old kind of like Reese bass type things. That's my side high track as well had, had that sound in. So, um, but you know, this, this obviously was just a sample, it's not synthesized or anything. So, you know, obviously you get quite a bit of control, but I think at the moment it's all about kind of atmospheric type stuff. So it's good to use a sound that isn't going to be too kind of thick and kind of dominating in the track. So you can add stuff like uh, on here, I've got uh, quite a bit of reverb. Actually, you can see the automation on the reverb here if I solo that as well. It's just like the vibe of a lot of the tracks at the moment, obviously, it's just kind of quite spacey and nice. So there you go, so not a lot to it, really. If I let the track play on a bit, we'll dip into some of the other stuff. There was lots of vocals as well to work with, but as soon as I heard this little, I think they say all hell's breaking loose or something. I think that's what they say. So I knew that would be, because I didn't want it to be a whole vocal track. You have you know, sort of mm. dipping into the vocals and finding little bits that I could use. And that was a standout thing kind of from the off. Did uh, you have an idea for the remix from the start? You know, when you hear that track or you start working on the beat and then stuff comes about? Um, I kind of didn't with this one. Mm. There's something I started today on the way up on the train actually, just kind of playing with. And as soon as, I, as soon as I'd heard the track, when they made the request to remix it, I knew what I wanted to do with it. Right. This one I wasn't sure, especially when I saw the parts, the stems, mm. it was just so many. It's yeah. just like, this could go anywhere. But, but the vocal stood out and the strings was what? They, they were the main yeah. things, yeah, completely, like the strings, the string part, I'll show you in a second. But people are doing a lot of things with pitched vocals and stuff at the moment. What I do is put them on a layer, if I just isolate these. So... That's the female one. In fact, maybe I didn't pitch this one. Oh, oh yeah, that one, that one is, pit, is pitched down. Yeah, so I've just used the Logic pitch shifter to pitch down, and then when they're both mixed together, you get that nice kind of... Oh, it's kind of a harmony type thing. Um, just move it on a bit. So these are parts as well from the original. This kind of vocal stab was really interesting because this was in the original track. So it was kind of like a ready-made little groove that was there. I changed the timing of it a bit because it was quite straight uh, and also brought the BPM down. So it kind of, you know, really lent itself straight away to the track, which was good. Yeah, this is all like in the original part. So I, I didn't actually do any of that stuff, but it just kind of worked. And as the track goes on, we end up, I end up using some of the vocal. And then the, uh, the string part, let me zoom out a bit and you can see a bit more. So again, loads of reverb and stuff, that real kind of atmospheric thing. Oh yeah, the vocals are there. There's the strings, they're really nice. Um, and I've cut some of those up and repeated them because they, and they sounded great, but because obviously they're very real with a lot of feeling and, and kind of had their own sort of timing, I had to kind of bring them back in line with the groove yeah, of the track. It sounds nice choppy though, it good. Yeah, well it was kind of done a little bit rough and ready actually, <laughs> but it works, it just kind of fits the vibe of what I'm doing at the moment for it to be quite raw. So I just say as well, there's quite a few people um, on the chat room asking about the sub bass. Yeah. So have you layered up the bass In this? there? Yeah. No, yeah. that's it's just the, the, sample, the sample and it's and it's. Um, I'm pretty sure I would have brought it in on its own channel. Let's just have a look. Who knows what I did? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There we go. So obviously, in reason, you've got your separate outputs. Just mm. to show you, if I was up to the top and hit tab, you've got these are your outputs that go to wherever you're rewiring to. So I just sent the organ bass right out. Uh, I don't know if there's anything other than the reverb 
on there anyway. Uh, let's just go back to here. So you can see the EQing that's on it. I've used the limiter as well to kind of make it a bit kind of squashy. This is one of the UAD limiters. There's several on there that you can use, but this is like, uh, I mean, there's loads of toys with UAD, but I think with any kind of big set of plugins, it's good to find like just two or three that do a certain job that you really can learn mm. really well. And whenever you reach for it, you know exactly what it's going to kind of do. And this, this is one for me. Uh, that I don't just use on the master or anything. I actually use it on on loads of stuff. So um, there's a bit of tape delay. There's somewhere that's obviously on the automation and a slight side chain as well. So you can see I brought the side chain, it's just the logic compressor uh, coming in off my drums uh, on bus number ten. Well, again, like I said earlier, they just come off my comes off my drum mix. Mm -hmm. So um, I used to have a I don't know if I, if I use this one. one. Yeah, one of my old templates I've used for this. All these blue uh, blocks at the top are just the silent kick drum that I used to use for running my sidechain. So I could just use uh, Audio 2 sidechain there and it would just feed off of that. But I didn't want the sidechain on the whole track. I just wanted it when the so the, the kick and the bass wasn't where they weren't mm -hmm. fighting each other, which we'll talk about again in a moment actually. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of it. Just a bit of heavy, I suppose, fairly heavy EQing. I actually really like the Logic EQs. I mean, EQs are EQs. There's lots of arguments with what plugin you should use for EQing, but I mean, it, you know, it's quite simple really. It's, it's good to keep things really straightforward because you're just going to overcomplicate what you're doing and stuff. But I like I like this. I like the analyzer and whatever. It just does the job for me. So I just use the you know the in the, in the box. EQ. So yeah, so the weight in that sound just literally comes from the sample because mm -hmm. it's quite, it's an old, it's a sample <laughs> from an old bit of kit that's going to have that feel, that weight to mm -hmm. it, you know, so. So yeah, um, let me just close that. That's kind of it with the, with this remix, to be honest. It's quite, it's quite simple and that's, I guess that was the appeal with switching my sound to this new project is that this can be quite kind of simple and you can have room to do interesting things and the BPM is slower and the, the, the feel to the whole thing is just completely different. I feel that it just gives you a lot more space to do interesting things with effects and, you know. And the groove as well, I think. Yeah, you know, yeah, as opposed to just kind of really kind of banging it out really because yeah. that's, that's yeah. kind of what it, where it got to before. I like, you know, having space in tracks and being able to, to do different things. Um, so I guess that's the Delphic remix, really. Uh, just trying to think if there's anything else on here. To... Just the arrangement thing, really. I mean, you know, arranging, you know, it's nice. It's, it's kind of easy at the moment to kind of draw out an arrangement and kind of have, especially with a track like this, because it's, it's not a big kind of, I guess like string thing was straight up just dance floor kind of record, whereas this is a bit more of a listen to thing as well as a kind of a, a club record, I suppose. But the arrangement is quite important, you know. Uh, there's not so many little tricks and things and whatever, and it's kind of a just quite a straight up kind of thing when I when I arranged it. Um, really, um, I remember taking out a section because it kind of went on a bit too long. But but anyway, um, arrangements kind of. It is important, but it's down to whatever you're working with, you know. Mm. Um, yeah, oh, the vinyl. <laughs> I don't know if you'll hear this. You probably will. <laughs> I don't know. I've, just for vibe, I like a lot of people are doing it at the moment anyway. But um, having the drum, because the drums can be really like squeaky clean sometimes, and uh, like don't, they don't kind of have an atmosphere to them. Um, I, I, I used to do a bit of studio work with um, with someone who said it's the glue. It's like you need a bit of glue. And I was like, what do you mean glue? <laughs> but the drums we were doing then were really clean, like super clean and like it was all about being how sharp and how tight. But you can't, sometimes you want it to be a bit more a of an... A grit in there. Yeah. yeah, and that's why I've been layering this. I mean, you can't really hear it that well there, but that's what this is along the bottom here is uh, a bit of vinyl crackle. Right. And it's really just subtle in the mix, but when, the, when you hear the drums uh, on their own or whatever, 
it's just there and it just really like lends something to mm. the to the track. I've done it a few times recently just because it's either that or like a a very slight reverb on drums and stuff just to fill the gaps. Mm. So that's what he meant by the glue. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's uh, let's just load something else up as well. Yeah, 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 go for it. Okay. Um, yeah, just a quick question because you said uh, you've got your drums on on one channel. Yeah. So you don't have you wouldn't have separate channels say for the snare or the bass drum you've got all drums going through one channel um yeah they would all initially be on their separate channels or their separate lane either in logic or or in reason but i mix them all to i set rather than send them to the output via their channels i send them all to a bus so they're actually all on one channel so then on that channel i can actually add compression eq anything else i can automate certain things that goes right across the drum mix rather than individual things. But each individual sound will have its own thing going on as well. So I might have a kick that the length changes maybe or the, or the, the volume changes. But overall, it all goes on the one channel. That's just, just how I, I work. I didn't used to do it, actually. It was, um, it was only about two, three years ago when I started doing it, but it's just made such a, a difference with the drums. And you can really push with, with limiting, compression, that kind of thing, you can really push the drums quite hard if you want to, you mm. know, just on one separate channel in itself. Um, but I'm a, like most people, a bit of a sucker for working too loud. So I have to kind of bring everything down a little bit. And it all, it all depends where that drum mix is, where that, the, the drum bus, drum mix, whatever. If, that, if I've got that on zero with a limiter on, then it's going to be cranked. Mm. So I'm going to pull everything else up around it. And sometimes that's not good for... Because I'll just mix as I go. I don't go, right now it's a mix down. I'll just do everything as I go. So, like, you constantly, everything starts fighting against each other, even with these tracks that have quite a bit, bit of space in. So it's good to kind of, if you do that, kind of bring the drums down. Don't have them on zero. Do that at the end. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if anyone knows any of these tracks, but um, I can load any of these up. Um, I guess we'll go into string thing because that's the one that really sort of brought this project to life this is totally in reason as well this is my old auto load from my studio so none of those bits of kit were used in fact nothing was used apart from let's just have a look because the first time i loaded it up for almost a year i think yeah literally just comes straight out of reason and i've just used my, the limiter that I use all the time on the, on the master, but obviously with the need to give the label a pre-master, they do their own mastering. I didn't even need that, so the whole track was quite simply in, um, in, in reason. So, I don't know what I was trying to achieve at the time. I can't really answer any, any <laughs> questions on, on, on the direction of string thing and what it was about, but that, the string sample I had was from an, a really old sample bank, uh, and I've just had it sat there in a to-do folder right. for so long, and I just ended up cutting it up on the keys. So I don't, I don't know why my controller isn't working, but I'll, I'll just show you here. So I literally started, so sometimes I start with drums, with originals, other times I just have a sample or something, and then I start building around it, so. So literally it's just two, two chords and that's it. Two very filtered down chords at the moment. Let's go to the second break actually because they're filtered up there. So there's such a lot of character in that, in no strings or any kind of live instrument there's a lot more character than just the, anything you can get from a, a plug-in. Um, so there was a whole range of, in fact, I don't know if I've got the original sample. No, I haven't actually, not on here. But anyway, that's just two chords of like 10 or there's a whole phrase, you know. So I took those out and literally just had those two and I was just like, okay. I tried some beats over it and it kind of wasn't really working. So I knew it just had to be like a melody or a bass line type thing. Um, so, and that was just going to be the breakdown. There's actually a little story. I don't know if Worthy will watch this, but 
he knows now anyway, but Worthy and I were talking about doing something together, like Spoon and Worthy type track, like two years ago now. And um, I did a little folder of ideas, and this was in there. Like, so this could have been a Worthy and Spoon collab, <laughs> like, ages ago, but it wasn't. Um, I just loaded it up and, uh, and finished the track myself kind of thing, because Worthy didn't have the latest reason at the time, so he couldn't load it. So all because of that, I think that <laughs> with this whole thing is quite right. So thank you, Worthy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love drum breaks. I'm real because like my thing was drum and bass mid '90s and a bit of house and stuff like the early rave stuff into drum and bass. But it was all because of actual drum breaks, really, rather than not. Oh, I love drum and bass. It was anything that's got that old school sample. You know the the, the drum breaks. I just love it. Any music, you know, w with that vibe to it. So I've used. That's a recycled loop again. Let me just, uh, I don't know which, which one it is, because I haven't loaded this up for a long time. There you go. So that's going back to the start of the session when I said about using loops, Whoops. but in your own way. Mm. That's, that's what I did. If you haven't seen Recycle or Dr. X player or whatever before, if I just go into here, literally just splits up every every hit for you beforehand and then in here you can just do what you like you know you can trigger from a MPC <coughs> type thing or you any keys or just draw them in I think I probably just drew these in and it looks like I've just kept part repeated part of the groove because you can tell by the sort of the steps that they're making because if I go I'm sort of playing it so when the when it actually uh, plays you can if it looks like a row of steps then it's kind of that's the way to split it up, original. isn't it? Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I have done my own thing with this, put my own kind of swing on it. So again, this is the original. It's a really nice drum break, uh, and then just using it for the skip kind of thing. Yeah. No, no kick drum, and I program this little kind of fill thing and then just built around it. And the drums are actually quite heavy compared to what I'm doing now. I mean, at the moment, I'm sort of using to do with bass and kicks, like sub bass and, and kick drums kind of clashing. I'm using really kind of thin, real punchy kick drums. Mm. Whereas this was before all of that. And yeah, it's pretty to weighty. What, this so what anyone yeah. else was doing, yeah. So it's quite <laughs> a, that's the kick. And again, same thing, real simple drums though. I mean, look, if I, So that would have been the first, it's quite, quite it's distorting a little bit actually, because um, cause I had everything up too loud again. Um, but yeah, that's what, that would, would have been the first kind of drum pattern I wrote to go in string thing. And from that, I just, you copy the pattern down, it appears as MIDI. I've just literally stripped layers out, lost that kind of double kick drum thing, because that wasn't working. Um, and that's kind of it really, it's kind of really simple drums on this. Uh, let's just let the track play a little bit. It's, it's just one of those things, this, this, those samples, as soon as you hear it, it's like real kind of, I don't know. It makes really got so that, that character, yeah. yeah. Well, that's the thing, I guess, it's hard to get because there's, there's so much music out there, so much going on. A lot of it's great, a lot of it's quite average, just mm. to, be, to be truthful yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that is lack of character. Mm. So I'm not saying everything I do has character in it or it just whatever, but it's such an important part of music, almost as important as production, really, that it's got that thing that everyone can latch onto mm. about it. And I think, you know, live strings, in any kind of house music or any dance music really in particular because it kind of doesn't belong there but it does do you yeah, know what I mean yeah, there's, yeah. there's something a little bit special about it so the next thing I guess is the bass which is the most simple bass pattern I think I've ever written in my life <laughs> there you go <laughs> so let me just very quickly just see if I can get this uh, keyboard working properly I don't know why it's... Oh, there we go. Just 
just needed waking up. So again, kind of in my former life, it was all the electro house bass signs were all about two sawtooths tuning one up, like five semitones or whatever. And I kind of took that thing, but with a completely different sound, just using a sine wave. Literally, I could probably just do it now for you. It's so simple. And again, you think how long you can spend sometimes looking through plug-in presets, looking through samples, whatever. Sometimes it's just right un under your nose all the time. So literally, two sine waves, so two oscillators running there. And then, So it literally is that, I think that's, I think that's, oh it's, yeah, it's on four, sorry. So I've just gone up full semitones, yeah. So, yeah, so that's literally how I made the bass sound, really, really simple. And it, it's kind of ludicrous how simple it, the pattern is. It's just like two notes and then it just drops down. But you immediately could tell how effective it was gonna be. Yeah. It's just one of those, just one of those things really not complex at all. Um, yeah, so what I would have done on this, I'm hoping, because I'm just gonna, there we go. So, because the whole track is, is in reason, uh, the, the side chaining and stuff obviously is all within within there. So the M-Class compressor is, is, is brilliant. You know, all the stuff you get with reason is really good. Um, I just personally, for mixing tracks, I'm so used to Logic. The, the, the latest version of Reason, which comes with like the SSL style mixer, uh, which is this. I haven't got into it at all yet, but I know it's going to do a great job. You know, when I get like a spare two, three weeks to just do <laughs> what I want, um, you know, I will, I will jump in on it. But um, you know, when studio time comes along, I really got to just focus on what I'm doing. So, you know, a, a lot of this stuff was done obviously within the track, just in in Reason. Although I didn't kind of mix anything complicated with it. So my side chain here just runs off of the kick. There's probably quite a complicated, anyone that knows reason will know you can just kind of do all your routing yourself here like this. So this, this is my auto load for reason. So if I hit the, let me just play this again. Maybe I've got, yeah, I've got the silent. This is the old, old auto load, wow. So this is a silent kick drum that you can see the signals going through the spider audio there. And this is just running in the background constantly, giving me loads of outputs of this silent kick drum to run down to any compressor that I want. So this kind of crazy cabling here is just running to uh, compressors and the side chain ins on the back. So that's what I did with, with the bass. So let me just loop up the bass and you can sort of hear. There, you can see that's that silent kick from the re-drum at the top that you can't hear, but it's literally just giving that signal there. If I take it off, it'll just be horribly clashy. Sorry, bypass, not turn it off. <laughs> it completely takes the character away. And not only is it taking that character away, it's now clashing with the kick, mm. obviously. It's about that kind of giving it room. Um, I guess that string thing, really. There's not really much more. It's just a little what sample as well. It's just a real old school sort of hip hop from a hip hop sample pack, just that old school thing. Again, arrangement's a really important thing and that, that kind of weird, kind of wood blocky sound, which I brought in. Um, That makes such a difference when that comes in. It di when you hear it like that, you just think, okay. But when you when you when it's in the track and it's it's doing its thing in there, it just you know it brings so much to it. And it's really, that's part of the effect. So that second time it drops, you've got to have something slightly different going on. I mean, for me with this music, every eight bars, you really got to have something different, or all the way through, have different little things going on in the background to add that kind of character. Tom Flynn is someone that does that. Like we just finished a remix together and he processes and processes and processes loads of takes of audio, like just effects and weird things and then he'll lift out little bits and you really get the same little effect twice. Mm. Like this is just straight up like 
few things repeating and stuff, but you know, and it make but it makes so much difference either in your arrangement to have different things happening every kind of eight bars or to have loads of different effects that you don't hear sort of twice, you know, it's a real, it's a really kind of important thing, otherwise it's just, your music's just going to kind of drag on a bit, you know. I think it kind of goes hand in hand with what you said earlier about, you know, standing out from the crowd, maybe giving it more character, you know, yeah. as you said, there's a lot of stuff out there and that is one of yeah. the ways to... Yeah, there's, there's a lot of great stuff out there, but there's a lot of things I hear, I'm sure people hear some of my music and go, oh, I wish you'd done that with it, <laughs> you know, and it's like, but I hear that with tracks all the time, I hear moments in records and I think, wow, it's so good, do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But if it had just done that, yeah. you know, that's that's the... But that's the thing, obviously, you know, I've had a label before, which is kind of a nice at the moment, but the new label, the food label, um, you know, we get sent so many uh, demos and stuff. Mm. Like, I'm sure like most labels at the moment. And um, a lot of it's great, but it's just like that little bit of extra effort in certain areas will make such a big such a big difference. Yeah, definitely. You know, and it's, it's just one of those things. But... String things just straight up, it, it does what it does really. And um, there's, what is this? Oh, a hand clap, there you go. It's like a live hand clap that went in there at some point. <laughs> so there you go. Just, again, arrangement and just keeping things moving and having that infectious kind of thing really. Uh, it's really important. Um, any questions before I close it on string thing? Questions in the room? We've got um, a couple of questions yeah. just about um, more on the kind of mix and, and EQ side, really. Um, yeah. uh, Mikey's asked, um, how do you process your kicks? Um, you know, is, do you have a kind of set method, I guess? Or? Not really. No. At the moment, it's all about the kick being almost the pulse mm -hmm. and the bass kind of doing the work, just the kick leaving. Um, I'll just load something else up while I'm talking. It's, so you it's take about the weight the, out of the kick? Yeah, not so much taking the sub out, but mm. it's like a kick with long re with a long release is kind of hard to control things around it. Mm -hmm. It's just about giving things space. Any great music is just about having space in the mix, whether that's sonically or mm. just even audibly. You know that that's the that's the important thing. I think if I load up what was the B side technically to that the rustic chip track because there's a lot of 808 sort of bass going on in this. So this one was, um, String Thing didn't have a B-side and Claude Von Strait wanted to sign it and he was like, we need to have another track. And I was like, right, this is brilliant. I'm so made up that they want to yeah. run with it, which was great. So I was just straight, straight into the studio and, um, and did this one. And again, this is sort of um, those kind of drum and bass pads, you know, kind of li liquidy kind of sound. I always loved all that stuff like Bookham and, you know, early Metalheads type stuff, you know, um, just brilliant. So. I just found a pad that I liked. And actually, this is out of the Reason sound bank. I didn't know what to use at the time, but I really loved this, this loop. So I have actually used one straight up. Um, gone against my principles of reprogram reprogramming them. But. So that came straight out of the Reason sound bank, actually. A couple of people have picked up on that before. <laughs> They're like, you use Reason, don't you? And I was like, mm, yeah, I do. <laughs> How did you know? Oh, that loop on Rusted Chip, that's, that. that's from Reason. Uh, so the pad again, if I just play it from there. Just that old school drum and bass sort of yeah. sound to it. So that straight away and that loop, straight away had a bit of a vibe to it. So this, when it comes in, it's got like an 808 uh, kick drum as the bass line. But what I've actually done, rather than, because sometimes the tuning of those samples is, yeah. is quite, because the 808 bass drum's got kind of a bit of a, kind of a pitch type pitch bend in it. So it's kind of hard to tune sometimes. So what I started to do was actually just make my own 808 with, just the sine wave in Subtractor. I'll show you how to do that as well, actually. Uh, but I've just put on a Subtractor. I mean, you could probably do this with most uh, decent synth plugins that have a good sine wave on. So there we go, and then... Then it's all about shaping that sound, obviously. So you want a bit of 
release on it. Also, you don't want it. I've heard some tracks with the 808s and they're not monophonic, as in they're all overlapping. The samples are just overlapping when you play like, like that. So that's cool. Some, sometimes that works, like the tones actually work together with the changes, but I put the polyphony on one. So each sound obviously cancels out the last. Um, and then it was all about uh, using the modulation envelope. So as soon as I bring that up, it kind of gives that a tacky thing at the beginning. And then bring down the decay. So you get a sharp attack. And then just, just play with the amount a little bit. And you've literally made what is pretty close. Yeah. It's not exact because the 808, the real 808 sound is just second to none, really. It's, it's amazing. But for pitching and stuff, if you if you know how to process bass and things like that, um, you know you can build your own and, and do that kind of stuff. I think I don't use it myself, but I know a lot of the guys use the. Is it the Rob Papen, the sub? The yeah, the the Predator thing. No, no. There's a sub. I can't remember what it is because I don't use it. Yeah, the boom bass, yeah, 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 for that stuff. Again, so, so built on the same principles, it'll do more stuff. But you know, this that's how I that's how I've I've been doing this. I did um I did something with hard drive deep inside for Strictly Rhythm as well. Same thing. Didn't use the real 808. I used used this um, on that because it just again more control. So if I go to the actual synth that's doing that again. You can see here, I've used the side chaining on it. It's only mono, so there's only one cable going into the side chain there. And I've actually put um, some overdrive on to kind of fill the sound out a little bit. So the screen basically, in reason, gives you distortion, kind of over compressed, kind of old school sort of sound. Um, so there's, there's some of that on there as well. I thought I used. Again, it's been a while since I loaded this up. Now the pulverizer's on something else. So again, what that, the side chain's actually giving the kick room, obviously. So the kick, I suppose there's, there's a little bit of sub on this one. It was like only the kind of second shadow child thing that I did. So um, getting used to the new ways of producing things and, and stuff. So again, would have worked the same sort of way with a drum groove. I know there's some hats that come in and some bongos and stuff as well. And that funny little whistling sound. Where is that? Weird, I can't find that, whist <laughs> that whistling sound, where is it? I'll give up. Anyway, yeah, that that kind of little, again, adding that bit of character to the track. Mm. I've had that little loop with the that whistly sound in it and just kind of laid that in too. So, yeah, so that's, again, where I really started to think about, because there's some with these, with bass music, it's about, obviously, that's the forefront, really, even over the drums. That's the mm. most important kind of kind of thing. And to give that the space that it needs to have the effect in a club or wherever you listen to it, it's really important to, ha to have that space around the kick. Uh. Cool. Um, we've got another question actually okay. um, from Steve Dow, who's asked um, how you approach um, the arrangements. Um, you know, is it something you do entirely on the fly or do you have a kind of like a template-ish to work from? Not really. I mean, the last two, three remixes I've done, I've noticed I've kind of done the same arrangement. Right, yeah. But there's n never a plan to do that. I guess it's just the, that's the progression I want to hear in the, in the tracks. Uh, so I don't ever... Again, I was with Tom Flynn recently, and he drew out the arrangement he had in his head on a pad. And <laughs> like, he'd like, literally drawn what it would look like if you zoomed out on Logic. And he was like, that, that's With what the it needs to do. Pen, like, yeah. Really? Wow. Yeah. And I was like, wow, okay, I haven't seen that one before. <laughs> I just kind of go with the vibe of what I'm doing and just let it, let it develop. But, you know, that, that, works, that works for him. And that's, you know, I'm not saying he does that all the time. Yeah, yeah, does, yeah. But, but he had a, it clearly had a very yeah, clear image he had a vision about for what it. he wanted. Yeah. I sometimes, sometimes I do. Like, with stream thing, I did. But mm. I, 
I could, could just arrange it quicker than I could draw it. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just one of those. But yeah, I mean, arrangement's really important. I think it's just important to keep the, keep people interested. Whether your track's five minutes long or ten minutes long, mm. just keep people interested for that whole time. However you do it, I don't think you know arrangement, particularly in a in a club when it's you know when you've got the crowd on your side and you can go where you want with them. You know, you you can do what you want if the music's doing the right doing the right thing. So you know, there, there isn't any, there shouldn't be any rules. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. Shouldn't be. But yeah, um, I started a started a remix today on the train on the way up, <laughs> which I originally didn't have time to do. But this track kept coming on on my iPod, the label that sent it to me. It kept coming on in the car, and every time I heard, I'd already said no to it. And every time I heard it, I was like, oh no, I wish I. would <laughs> hadn't said no now because uh, there's so many things in there that sound really great, so many things that I wanted to kind of work with. I said, look, send me the parts. If I get time before the end of January, mm. I'll, just, I'll just do it. So, um, yeah, so I'll just show you. I literally started this today on the, on the train. So what I do with remix parts is I put them in Ableton. I find the stretch the, in, in Ableton for any tempo changes is really a lot smoother than anything else at the moment. Other people might disagree, but that's, mm. that's what I do. Um, and I normally do, because the original track was 85 BPM. I'm not going to go through Ableton and stuff, because everyone's seen kind of, you know, how to do that before. But uh, these are the parts, uh, the original parts, not loads. Um, they're 85 BPM, as you can see. Um, this one I knew I was going straight in at 124. Sometimes it might be either side of that. So out of Ableton, I'll export 120, 124, maybe 126. So if the track's not quite, if it needs that little bit of kind of pick up to it with the tempo or something, then I can just immediately, I don't have to go all the way back through Ableton, yeah. do it all again. I've got, I've got them there ready to go. So that's just like a good, good little tip uh, rather than keep going backwards and forwards. Um, so today, yeah, I put the remix stems in. Um, it's really interesting track actually. It's a little bit James Blakey, like the right. kind of, with the kind of sawtooth synth, you know, that James Blake uses. There's a bit of that going on in there, but the song's really great. Uh, and like I say, it was really kind of infectious with me and there's some good parts with it. So I've actually used most of the parts so far and I've not done too many vocal, full vocal kind of records because it's all about it's more of a club thing and little teases of vocals rather than a, a song. Mm. But this, I think this will work as a song and I'll do like kind of a dub version with it eventually as well. So this literally was done on my headphones on the way up today from uh, Portsmouth, so it's been like an hour really, an hour and a bit. Let's just give you a little... Uh, they called that a guitar. Doesn't sound like a guitar <laughs> to me, but I've called it a, gu a guitar anyway. So really nice parts again. If you get a remix with great parts, it's like, you know, you, you're off the money really. There's the sort of James Blakey. Kind of synth, which is really nice. Good vocals yeah, it as well. Sounds great, doesn't it? Yeah. Is it really this time? Yeah. Is it really this time? Is it really this time? That kind of sound that's on the vocal, it's already quite processed. It wasn't completely dry. Sometimes you get options, obviously, with nothing, no processing on it at all. Mm. But this is just how it is. So if I get part way through and I think I'm not keen on their processing, because at the moment I'm sort of 50 50 on it, I may well go to the label and say, can I have completely dry? stem of the vocal so I can just process it myself but it's not too bad but but on the 85 BPM version the processing sounds great but because mm. I've speeded it up that processing that is on the stem already it's not it's not great so I don't know I'm just gonna live with it for the moment um, a cuff, nice floaty arpeggio some pads and um, what was this what was this here? oh it's just something I've repeated so yeah, I just kind of went in. I play. I play you what I've done so far. Nothing's mixed, so we'll see how good it sounds. It's just literally quite raw on it. I mute the vocal for the moment, so you can just. Kind of still sounds like two tracks jammed together, like glued together at the moment. It won't do, obviously, but this is my first kind of play about with it. You see what you mean about the vocal, though. You know, already yeah. you can sit Well, yeah, arrangement-wise, I don't know if I would drop the vocal straight in there, but it's just there for vibes at the moment. I need this more than you. 
So actually, because I was on the train, Reason comes with a dongle now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or if you're online, you can type in your login and it'll open. So I was on the train and I didn't have the Reason dongle with me, so I couldn't start my drums. Or I couldn't start any of this with, you know, with Reason. So I've used, actually used some ESX drums, which I've, I rarely use, but um, I may keep it, I may not, I don't know, but I quite like the snare at the moment. Mm. So I've just used an e and literally an ES ESX uh, drum kit here just to get, like, kind of get going and it works. And I've also used the EFM one, which is like built on old FM synthesis, like a DX7 or something. And that was a preset that I've just manipulated a little bit. Uh, like the default sound, look, I've not even, you know, I've just kind of built on that really. I think presets are great as a starting point, but if it's something that's quite obvious, definitely just play with it and reprocess things and, you know, try new things with it because you, what you don't want is like what happened with me with that other track. And some <laughs> kid comes on and says, yeah, I heard that loop in the Reason sound bank. And you're like, okay, <laughs> next time I'll try harder. Um, but yeah, that literally just manipulated the, the default sound in the EFM. Quite simple, really. And then at the moment, there's no side chain on it because um, there's a slow attack on the sound. It's not actually clashing that much with the kick. If it had a real sharp attack on it, then it would clash with the kick a bit. So I would need a bit more, probably some side chain, but because the, there's hardly anything of the kick, it's just literally there, like I said earlier, almost as a, a guide for the track rather than a big booming kind of kick. Oh, these, li these little pitched ad libs as well, I love these, really good. Once I did get Reason going on the train, I plugged my phone in, I've never used it for that tethering thing, but it got me to load Reason up anyway, so that's fine. Um, I started adding hi-hats and stuff from Reason. Some people that use re that rewire Reason with Logic and other programs might be saying, why is he using both sequences? Because I can sequence everything in Logic mm. and just literally not use this window at all and just use this like a kind, kind of like plugins really. But I've got so used to the Reason sequencer and the integration between that and their devices that I just need to use both. So I do... I have kind of got two arrangements going on yeah. in all, all my tracks, which um, might be a pain in the backside for some people, but I'm just used to it. So again, just real basic drums at the moment. It will develop a lot more as I do more work on it, but... Let me just go back to the vocal actually and just... What I've done here is separate this audio nine is actually vocals as well. And because I want the same effects on those two tracks, what I've done is bust them together. So again, like I did with the drums, I've used bus one for the vocals. That's how you get to there. And that's vocals as well. So same thing. And then this is that, that bus here, org six. And I can just stick any effect on there and whatever comes through bus one, whether I send through it will obviously uh, come out. <laughs> You can hear the crazy delays. Delays on vocals, especially with songs. If you're using vocal stabs, go to town. But I think with songs and lyrics, you want to hear the dynamic in the voice. So I never go over the top with delays and stuff. Reverbs are kind of a di kind of different, but with delays, you're obviously re-triggering uh, what was originally there, and it can kind of get a bit confusing, but I always have a slight sort of delay on the vocals depending on what I'm working on. So anyway, so that. I also didn't plug this in on the train. I used, to, <laughs> I used, I used um, if you hit tab, uh, let's say it's shift lock, you get this little uh, keyboard. So I was sat on the train and people were looking at me while I was like, it's like, is he typing like weird things or what's he Just doing? One finger yeah, typing. Yeah, 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 it's quite weird. Uh, I don't normally work a lot on the road. I do, I like, edit things and like I've got the UAD box which I take with me which is the satellite that runs all the UAD plugins. 
and that's it. So I don't even normally take this with me. Like I don't use this in my studio. This is just if I need it out and about, like today. Um, so yeah, it was kind of a bit weird using a. But people do. It's all about the end result, as they say. So I don't know where this track will end up um, musically, but that's the backbone of it. And again. This is what I say when I went back to when you said, do you have uh, any idea when you listen to things, mm. what exactly what you can do? I sort of knew straight away what I wanted to do. Whether that bass line stays the same or not, I don't know. The sound I really love, so mm. that's cool. But it can easily be a vocal version of this of this track as well as something more kind of DJ bass, which would just be a big... Or something yeah, like yeah, that. just a big bass line thing and a, mm. and a groove, basically. We've got one more question here. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I just uh, really love the, the bass sound on there and just wondered whether you could say a bit about uh, how you how you made How that. I did it? Um, really simple, actually. Um, I keep scrolling the wrong way because normally I'm going to do it now because normally logic is there. <laughs> That's why I keep going the wrong way. Uh, right, so I just literally soft, soft instrument in logic, um, EFM1, and you get this, which sounds like old Derek May sort of record or whatever. And then I literally started manipulating that and changed, I think it was this. And then changed the FM depth on it as well. But that's pretty much, pretty much the same. Garage and bass then, line straight Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Well, you know what, I've, I've, never, I've rarely used the Logic plugins. I mean, I mean, they are great, but I've got my ways of doing things in, in reason, really, and because I'm so used to it. Um, pads and things I use, Omnisphere, June mm. I, I quite like uh, as a synth plug-in and stuff. So I don't really dip into the Logic synths, the processing I do, but not the synths. And, uh, but yeah, so I loaded that up by accident, actually. I was looking for the <laughs> ES one, and then just clicked it, I'm like, oh, okay, this sounds like old Detroit, sort of whatever, or old Rays, and there you go, they're all the noises that are back in again, obviously, at the moment. Yeah, so, so yeah, that, yeah, just straight straight out of a plug-in. Now everyone's going to do that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. There's a, there's a couple of questions, actually. One of yeah. them being exactly that about the bass line, so uh, all good on that one. Um, Dan Brennan has also asked, um, well, he said that he tends to get stuck um, with kind of breakdowns and, and build up to the drop. Obviously, you know, your tracks uh, seem to be, you know, pretty, pretty good for that. So he's asked any, any advice on that kind of thing? Just teasing stuff. I mean, I haven't got to, to do <laughs> it on this one yet, but let me load up something else that is finished uh, that might be familiar. Uh, I'm trying to think which one. I suppose this, which is off my last EP. I've got a list of titles for tracks that <laughs> often come from me not knowing what to call something when I save it. And I'm actually like, oh, that one's all right, actually. I'll keep that and use that one day. And Sensible haircut is, uh, yeah. Someone also talked about that in the chat room, actually. What, the name? Yeah, just what is what a sensible haircut, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I think I heard it on TV once. I mean, I've had that, that, would have, that name would have been around for ages, actually, a long time, and then I'll just stick it on something yeah. that I think deserves it. I don't know why, that, why this track deserved that name, but anyway. Oh, yeah, just, just really quickly, um, I haven't talked about this yet, with the drum programming, because obviously the drums have got, got a lot of, lot of thing and, and feel to them. Um, I mean, you can do all your grooves and stuff, stuff in Logic and Cubase and whatever you use. You know, there's always tools to do these things. But this, in reason, is just so good. Um, you know, this, this uh, regroove. Um, and you can apply different grooves to different channels, basically. And I, that's where I get a lot of that swing and a lot of that feel. Mm -hmm. So I might want, like in that last track, although I did it in uh, Logic, if I'd have done it in here, I would have had a really strong shuffle on those snares. Almost so, they, they're hitting on the one, so you get that real kind of tight, kind of skippy feel. Whereas the hi-hats, I might not have such a strong kind of skip or shuffle on, on them. So this is really good and really quick for getting those, those kind of grooves together and stuff. Um, using this for any, any reason users, you know, have a play about with it uh, and stuff, because it's, uh, it's good fun. Um, okay, sensible haircut. <laughs> uh, to answer your, uh, the question, was it? From, yeah, yeah, like about the, from about the, yeah, yeah. From Dan. It's just about kind of teasing and stringing things out a little bit. 
uh, like repeating a vocal like mm -hmm. that that remix that I just talked about I'll probably just repeat the end of the phrase of the vocal for like two extra bars or three and just do something there so rather than a big long 16 bar build and build yeah. I mean those records you know obviously work really well anyway but with that I'll probably just do a little subtle kind of extra four bars just to tease that the drop kind of coming mm. back in so there's different things you can do with I mean with string thing and stuff and a couple of the remixes I've copied an old I'm a Van Helden trick which is that right. repeating the yeah yeah who it has to be said is pretty amazing when it comes to yeah but it's a drop. really effective way of of, of bringing that kind of impact mm. along, that kind of tease that the drums are coming back, literally that kind of drums kind of repeating, getting louder, like a section of the drums, like from the snare onwards or something, and then just, you know, just kind of hitting it. So it's not a new thing. I'd mm. never say, oh, you know, but then not many people were doing that recently, and I think yeah. that's why that effect kind of stood out. So, I mean, I guess, you know, there's, with all the sample banks now, there's, there's just endless kind of, you know, build up noises mm. and things and stuff, but they're all good to use. But like I said at the start, I think do, doing your own stuff, You're doing your own a bit little more tricks. Creative with it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because you know, they're, again, they're the things that sometimes an, an, an accident as well will will help. There was a track a collab I did with, with DJ Zinc like about four years ago now, and we copied over the ho a whole section of the track, like 16 bar section or whatever it was, and he, he actually dropped it all one track down. <laughs> and like, but the, so all the MIDI was playing the wrong instruments. Right, yeah. Do you see what I mean? So, but that section of the track is just like, we never could have achieved that. That was like <laughs> a happy accident. And it sounded great and we just kept it in there because it's one of those like, one of those things. It's just about teasing people, especially in a club on a mm. dance floor and about keeping that, that interest there and not seeing people go off to Let text their mates. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you want to keep people there. So, so yeah, just with breakdowns and and, and drops, it's all about just, just that little kind of teasing things, you know. Um, so the Sensible Haircut track, again, I think it's all reason apart from the vocal. Yeah, so you can just see the vocal in there and the mix as well. So again, everything mixes through. I've brought things in on the separate channels. Here the drums and stuff. Um, Drum programming on this. Can't remember what I did now. I remember there was that really kind of tight, short, snappy sort of snare was something I wasn't sure about to start with. I don't know where it is. Oh yeah, that's that. Again, that was just like a cushion sound in a sound bank. Because there's not really, there's not really a bass line to this. It's just kind of a, you know, for, as a, for an effect. There you go. There's the snare. And I was like, is that cool? I don't know. But it kind of everything kind of works nicely together. I also I sampled. I've got. I keep buying old '90s keyboards because you can get them for about 100 quid at the moment, <laughs> like like old Korgs and stuff. Like an yeah. M1, you can get yeah. so cheap. And and like just been kind of sampling bits out. So I used like Universe, that sound there is from that. It's just in there as a sample. So something's not sounding right with this. So there's obviously a plug-in missing or, or something like that, like I haven't noticed. But it's kind of a quite a somber, it's not quite a big party record like string thing, it's something that's different. It's slightly deeper, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes rather than looking for that big impact, like, oh, there's a drop and bang, it's all back in. It's sometimes just about introducing things again, slowly. So this just, the percussion just slowly built back in and it's really effective. It's funny, one of the first people I saw to play it, only recently, like I, I knew lots of people playing it, like Dan was playing it, eats mm. everything and a few other, other guys. But um, I saw Major Jane Coles play at the DJ Mag Awards. Oh, really? Yeah, and I was, uh, that was the first time I really took it in without me playing it. Because yeah. obviously I'm playing it, I'm also queuing something else. I'm probably pointing at something, trying to look, 
Like I'm, <laughs> yeah, yeah, being a DJ or whatever. <laughs> and um, I'm not listening to it the same, but listening to someone else play it in a, in a, to a crowd like that was just, it was brilliant. I can see it for her as well, you know. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That kind of sound. Well, again, no kick drum for 16 bars, but just that sound really kind of opening up. I don't know, it's just, it, it's a different way to like the string thing kind of, kind of effect, you know. And it cuts right back down. Yeah, it just cut, just, yeah. just kind of cuts right back down. So, I don't know, I, I just, I just think it depends what elements you've got in, in your, in your track. If mm. you've got things you can repeat, like repeating vocals, I haven't brought it with me, but if I just, um, uh, the other tribe, I think. Yeah. Right. I wasn't actually that keen, don't tell them. If you want. <laughs> I wasn't actually that keen on the vocals to start with. So that's just that, before the drop, just a simple slow down thing. Everyone's looking at all my tunes that I've got now. <laughs> <laughs> but again, just repeating the vocal, that little bit. Everyone expects it to drop, but it doesn't. And a little but you've got that in there as well. It's all kind yeah, of... Yeah, like... Cool. Yeah, that again, old school, old school hip hop sort of little vocal. Just that. I don't know. Quite, quite simple, really. Mm. And also... I'm sorry I'm only playing this to you from iTunes, it's really nothing to look at, but those kind of, that kind of glockenspiel sound, whatever it is, is, that was just one stab, and I just kind of sampled that and then played a melody with it. So again, with remix parts, it's not just about what you've got and how it comes, it's about, you know, replaying stuff, kind of going a bit old school on it, because that's how it used to be, was sample a sound and then play your own thing rather than rely on a nice bit of audio mm. and cutting out a bit, you know, it's kind of doing, going niche tomorrow mm. with it. So. Cool. Any, any more questions, guys, in the room? No. Um, we've got um, more, qu there's a few about, about Shuffle, which you kind of went through in yeah. reason as well. Um, we are kind of approaching time at the moment, um, but it is worth saying, you know, that this full session will be archived as well. So, um, yeah, if you do have any more questions, technical-wise, we'll, we'll try and get on it later on. Um, anything else you want to go through? I think I'm done with tracks. I mean, I've, yeah. I've kind of covered most things that I wanted to, to kind of go through. I guess just on, from a creative point of view, is it's, mm. I just think it's really important to just find your, your thing that you want to do and not worry too much about what everyone else is doing. Because I think it's easy, and I've been through it several times, even as recent as last year with this transition to what I'm doing now, where I sit in the studio and I just get really frustrated because... Yeah you know, finding that thing that's going to like appeal to people or finding, you know, that, that bit of creativity. But as soon as you've got that one thing that will spark you off, it'll just, it'll come, you know, you've just got to keep kind of going and listening to music as well, even if it's not the style of music, listening to things in music, you know, what, what's layered in there, what's really worked, what's effective, or going to listen to a DJ maybe you wouldn't listen to normally, mm. just to break the habit that you're in and go and go and actually just try something different for a little while and it'll bring back different things to the studio for you, you know. And also things like, oh, I keep mentioning the sound banks, but it's true, if, they, if, you, if something's not working for you, just archive it all on a hard drive and put it away and like, mm. use something else, start again. Like all my drums and stuff, they're all different drums to what I would have done before. I mean, it's a whole new project anyway, so it's irrelevant, but it's, it's really important, I think, to just have, you, you have your sound sources coming from a fresh, place sometimes and mm. you know that will kind of inspire you you'll end up with things that you never thought you would you would sort of end up with from from just having something that's new and different yeah mm. well really good advice um and yeah i think that's probably it from us Thank you. um as i say the the session will be archived um on the youtube channel um and if you do want to find out a bit more information about point blank just head over to the website and uh, keep locked to the facebook and everything like that um so yeah that's it from us uh, let's just give it up for, for shadow child Nice one. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye-bye.